Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. And at question number one, I call Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what road improvements are being carried out in the A77 and A70 to address any challenges faced by road users. Minister Jenny Gilruth. The Scottish Government continues to invest in the safe and efficient operation of the A77. Planned improvements for 2023 include slope st uh, stability works at Glengall, the upgrade of a number of existing laybys, upgrades of the Whitlets Dutch House roundabouts, and improvements to existing drainage at Cairn Ryan. Since 2007, the Scottish Government has invested approximately £64 million on five separate road schemes on the A77, including the recent completion of the £29 million Mabel Bypass, which opened in January of 2022. The A70 is a local authority road. Sharon Dowie. I thank the Minister for that answer. The A77 is a vital trade link between the Central Belt, Ayrshire and Northern Ireland, and the A70 could become a strategic link into the heart of Rabi Burns' homeland in Ayrshire. These are very important roads for local people, for trade and for tourism. The lack of good public transport links means that people rely on the A70 and A77, but the roads are crumbling and there are major safety concerns, especially in dark winter nights. So can I ask the Minister, will the SNP focus on improving these vital roads or has their coalition deal with the Greens stopped any chance of extra investment in the roads in Ayrshire? Minister. I very much uh, understand the sentiment of Mr Dowie's question. We have uh, invested, of course, particularly in the A77, um, and I'll detail some of the spend in relation to, to maintenance thus far. But I, I recognise some of the challenges she's outlined in relation to connectivity and public transport. There are challenges across Scotland at the current time, and that's why I'm focused on how we can better improve uh, you know, delivering that modal shift from car onto rail and onto bus. One of the ways in which we do that, of course, is through a very generous concessionary bus travel scheme, which means that almost half of the population in Scotland can travel for free by bus. Now, to the specifics of um, Sorry's question in relation to the A77, um, recommendation 40 of the STPR2, which published in December of last year, includes improvements on the A77. Um, and, of course, the Cabinet Secretary will uh, deliver a statement to that end uh, later today. On the maintenance spend in 22-23, investment has continued so far this year. £9 million has been spent specifically on the 77. The following schemes have been completed in this year alone. So, uh, North End of Kilmarnock Bypass has been resurfaced. Um, the A77 to the B7038 Kudum Interchange has been resurfacing. We've had resurfacing. Briefly, as, please, as I Minister. On Dutch House, I will not go through the, the further detail. I think Ms. Dowie has asked me a parliamentary question on this, a written parliamentary question before, but I hope that reassures her the level of investment coming from this government into the routes that she's asked about today. Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Maybole bypass on the A77, which opened in February last year, represented £29 million of Scottish Government investment and was described as a dream come true by those who campaigned for it. Can I ask the Minister if the Scottish Government has any data or means of assessing the difference this project has had on the experience of road users? Minister. Um, the Member may remember, I recall opening the Maybole bypass uh, only this time last year, actually, and I know how uh, significantly uh, transformative that project has been for the local community already. Transport Scotland is planning to undertake evaluation of the bypass this year. We will look at data collection from the spring. That will be in line with the Scottish Trunk Road Infrastructure Project evaluation, which is hugely important. It will look at the scheme objectives, the operation, the environment too, and the completed evaluation will be published on Transport Scotland's website. And a further evaluation will be undertaken three years after opening. Thank you. Question number two, Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child Incorporation Scotland Bill, including the latest discussions it had had with the UK Government. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Preparations for reconsideration stage are well underway. This includes engagement with the UK Government officials on proposed amendments to bring the bill within legislative competence. Discussions with UK Government officials currently focus on what the Supreme Court judgment means for the application of the UNCRC compatibility duty when a public authority is acting under powers conferred by UK acts in devolved areas. My officials are exploring options and Parliament will be updated on what this means for the provisions in the Bill after these have been carefully considered. The Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to incorporating the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child into Scots law as far as is possible within devolved competence. 
Martin Whitfield. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but looking at the minutes of the varied committees and groups that are involved in this with government representatives, there have been varying responses to people about asking updates on the bill. In September last year, the Scottish Government was still on track to have the bill by the end of the year. October last year, we therefore have no timeline as yet. November last year, we can't say whether the amended bill will be presented to Parliament before the end of the year. And back in October again, we are fairly confident that the amendments we have proposed will address legislative competence. So what is the position, Cabinet Secretary? Have amendments been drafted? Are they sitting with the UK Government? And what is the deadline for the date of response from the UK Government on this? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I can assure Mr Whitfield that, of course, uh, we have been looking um, at detailed amendments, but can I point out to him we are not the only player um, in this, and the difficulty is it's exceptionally complex when you're looking at not just what is happening and the views of the Scottish Government, but also the sovereignty of the UK Parliament and the Supreme Court judgment. So I appreciate this has taken longer uh, than any of us uh, would have hoped, but particularly, I think, given the overall approach to the UK Government on issues of the powers of this Parliament, I think it is very important that we understand the views of the UK Government, we take time to ensure that we do, and whether those have implications on how we amend the bill. But I can assure the member that our programme of work to embed children's rights continues at pace and that is not relying on the, on the development of the, the bill and that work is continuing. Okay. Before we move on to question three, I would again uh, emphasise how helpful it would be if questions and responses were concise and I call Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it's had with the stakeholders regarding retraining and upskilling the North East energy sector workforce. Minister Richard Lockhead. The oil and gas sector and its highly skilled workforce have long been at the forefront of energy innovation and have a really important role to play in Scotland's energy transition. On the 2nd of November, in partnership with Industry and Skills Development Scotland, we held an offshore energy skills summit with key stakeholders that focused on delivering a just transition for the offshore energy workforce, including sharing views and insights and encouraging greater collaboration and pinpointing where more action is required. And of course, throughout our recently published draft energy strategy and just transition plan, we've also set out a pathway to ensure a fair and just transition for our energy workforce. Audrey Nicholl. I thank the Minister for that response. During a recent visit to a geodata specialist company in the North East, I heard about the way remote technologies are offering opportunities for workforces to be located elsewhere, and in some cases out with Scotland. So can the Minister outline how the Scottish Government is supporting businesses ut utilise their extensive knowledge base in subsea marine engineering, including developing remote technologies, while at the same time attracting and securing the future workforce in the North East and across Scotland? Minister. Um, I thank the member for raising that, and I've visited many companies myself involved in taking forward such technologies, and it's really incredible to see the innovation that is out there, particularly in the northeast of Scotland in the offshore sector, where people are looking at opportunities in clean energy and renewable energy as part of the energy transition. Uh, in Scotland, of course, we've got the most advanced hub in Europe for the testing and demonstration of marine energy technologies, so we're hopefully ideally placed to both shape and benefit the future uh, potential of the global marine energy market. We've also supported a number of initiatives such as £18.25 million to Wave Energy Scotland and £75 million for the Energy Transition Fund. Uh, and there's a number of other measures underway, much of which is referred to in the draft plan I just uh, mentioned that's been published. So it's a really important agenda we're intending to support. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The energy strategy trumpets a figure of 77,000 low carbon energy jobs by 2050, but the Scottish Government has no idea what those jobs are, no roadmap for how they'll be delivered, and no idea what the average salaries of those jobs will be, and thus whether they are comparable to the current ones. So, does the Minister understand why the energy strategy was also forced to report? The majority of respondents to the survey of workers tended to express low confidence in a just transition for the sector, and the oil and gas workers believe the impact on their jobs would be negative. Minister. Uh, can I just point out to the member, it's not the Scottish Government that's simply trumpeting these figures, as he phrases it. This is the results of research from the likes of RGU in Aberdeen in his own region. I suggest he visits that uh, esteemed university and discusses with them the research that we're quoting uh, in our draft plan, which says that 
It is estimated we can have the number of jobs going from 19,000 in 2019 to 77,000 by 2050 as a result of the just energy transition in terms of the number of low carbon jobs. That is a net gain in jobs for the Members region. He should be celebrating that and the, and the measures been taken by this Government to bring that to reality. And he should speak to the many organisations out there that agree with the Scottish Government. This has got massive potential to deliver new jobs for the Members' constituents. Question number four has been withdrawn. Question number five, Claire Baker. Um, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is encouraging increased patronage on rail routes serving Mid Scotland and Fife. Minister Jenny Gilruth. The Scottish Government is investing in the new railway to Cameron Bridge and Leven and the electrification of rail services in Fife. ScotRail's recently launched half price ticket offer is just one way in which the Scottish Government funding is helping to ensure a publicly owned and operated ScotRail can deliver real benefits and savings for passengers. Additionally, once launched, the ScotRail Peak Fares pilot will apply to all routes for the whole six months, encouraging people back to rail. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for the answer. As she knows, um, the cost of peak rail travel remains prohibitively expensive for many, and she'll know that in Fife uh, the cost per mile is more expensive than the rest of Scotland, and we have some of the most restrictive peak travel um, measures put in place. Uh, in her reply, she said that the pilot on peak fares would apply to all routes. Um, at the committee last week, the Cabinet Secretary threw doubt on this and he said there wasn't the resources to provide for every route. The pilots would be limited to particular routes. In the Courier newspaper last week, a spokesperson for the Scottish Government said it would apply to all routes. So can, you know, can she give me confidence and clarity that this will apply to all routes across uh, Mid-Scotland and Fife? Because there has been confusion created Briefly, by the Ms. Cabinet Baker. Secretary last week. Minister. I, I recognise the point that Ms. Baker makes us. At Mr. Matheson's appearance last week, he reiterated the Scottish Government's commitment to remove peak fares via a six month pilot. For clarification, the peak fares pilot will apply to all routes uh, for the full six months during the next financial year. It is true to say that work on the precise methodology and design is ongoing, and my officials in Transport Scotland are working very closely with ScotRail Holdings and ScotRail to deliver maximum benefit to that extent. But I reiterate that the pilot, backed by £15 million of Scottish Government investment, will apply to all ScotRail routes for the whole six months. I hope that reassures the member. Willie Rennie. Uh, last June, I asked the, the Minister when we were going to get a decision about the Newborough stag and the proposal for a Newborough railway station. She said she would promise to share those those timescales with me. It's six months on. When are we going to get a decision? Minister. As far as I understand it, the Newborough detailed options appraisal is currently being reviewed by officials and a response is going to be provided imminently. Transport Scotland officials have been working to give advice more broadly to Cess Transit key stages uh, at the ongoing appraisal that I mentioned, but more than happy to write to Mr Rennie on the update to that work. But it is ongoing, um, as I have outlined. Question number six, Jamie Halcrow Johnston. To ask the Scottish Government how it will improve transport connectivity for Scotland's islands. Minister Jenny Gilruth. The Scottish Government is taking forward a range of actions to improve connectivity for our island communities. Work on the island's connectivity plan is underway. The draft long term plan for vessels and ports was published in December of last year, with formal public consultation to begin this year. Earlier this month, I announced a further significant investment in our ferry network with a commitment to four new major vessels to serve Isla and the Sky Triangle routes alongside further port investment at Tarbot, Loch Maddy and Uig. I have also recently announced a six-month fare freeze on our ferry networks. Jamie Halker johnston uh, the, thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister won't need reminding that Scotland's ferries fleet is ageing and increasingly unreliable, with breakdowns often leaving communities cut off. And as has been raised in this chamber far too many times, we need serious investment in our ferries fleet and we need it to start and be ongoing from now. But we should also be con giving consideration to fixed links, uh, assessing the economic and social benefits where fixed links are feasible, and also consulting with island communities themselves on what transport options they want. So can I ask the Minister what the Scottish Government is how the Scottish Government is undertaking work into fixed links for some of our islands and on some of our mainland communities and how they are engaging with local stakeholders, including residents and businesses? Minister. I thank the member for his uh, question. In, in relation to engagement, I was in Arran on Monday of this week, engaging with the local community there, and I engage regularly as Transport Minister with uh, local communities on the issues he has raised. Um, I think it's worth pointing out there has been significant investment from this government. In the last year alone, we have bought and deployed an additional vessel on the MV Law Freezer. We've chartered the MV Arrow, of course, to provide additional capacity on the network. We've made significant progress in the construction of vessels 801 and 802. We've commissioned two new vessels for Isla and 
uh, progress that additional investment in our key ports and harbours. And I mentioned in my initial response that additional uh, funding that is going to be provided uh, to the tune of £115 million pounds to provide CMAL uh, additionality to provide two further major vessels. And I think that is important because it will bring a degree of standardisation to the fleet. Now, to the member's point in relation to fixed links, um, this was considered through, of course, SCPR2. The Cabinet Secretary will give an update on SCPR2 later this afternoon, and I am sure he will be able to provide the member with further detail. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Orkney ferries are old and in need of replacement, and the Council there have been asking for assistance from the Scottish Government for many years and are yet to receive it. Can I have this, ask if the Scottish Government will now agree to run these services or at the very least provide access to CMAL to replace these ferries and lease them back to the Council? Minister. I didn't quite catch the start of Ms Grant's question, but in relation to local authority uh, ferries, of course, I recognise some of the financial challenges here, but it, it is worth saying that we do provide significant funding to support local authorities in uh, the delivery of these vessels. So we have provided over £136 million in the last five years alone to support the running of these services. Now, the Deputy First Minister has already committed, as part of the budget process, to that further work the member alluded to, with both uh, Shetland and Orkney in developing their fleet replacement plans recognising, of course, the challenges that those islands face. And we're also aware of the growing need for local authorities to replace their ageing ferry fleets and infrastructure. And while, of course, responsibility for funding replacement infrastructure does remain wholly with councils, we're committed to continuing that engagement. And I look forward to the outcome of that ongoing work uh, with my officials in Transport Scotland and Orkney and Shetland. Question number seven, Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on zero tolerance of sexual harassment and supporting victims of abuse. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. The Scottish Government is committed to building a safer Scotland free of sexual harassment and sexist behaviour. We are determined to tackle the scourge of sexual harassment wherever it happens, whether it is in public spaces, places of education or in workplaces. And through Scotland's equally safe strategy, we are tackling the underlying attitudes and inequalities and the culture that perpetuates this behaviour. We also support victims of abuse by investing record levels of funding, including significant levels of funding in frontline services, to support victims of violence against women and girls. Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. If the SNP Government has zero tolerance of sexual harassment, if they support victims of abuse, why was Patrick Grady allowed back into the SNP after he was suspended for sexual assault? His victim said, the decision to give Grady his job back while I've lost mine is a slap in the face to anyone who's experienced sexual harassment. What does the government have to say to the person that Patrick Grady abused? Um, <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, I will remind members that questions that are put to ministers of the Scottish Government must be on matters for which the Scottish Government has general responsibility. We will therefore move on to the next question, which is question number eight, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, <clears throat> I'll say that again, to ask the Scottish Government how it is tackling the gender pay gap. Minister Richard Lockhead. In 2022, Scotland's median gender pay gap for full-time employees was 3.7%, which was lower than the UK at 8.3%, and that's been the case since 2003. Of course, we're not complacent, and we're undertaking a range of actions, including investing £15 million in the coming year to contribute to the design of our year-round system of school-aged childcare for those families in the lowest incomes, also an additional £20.4 million for local carer support from 22 to 23, and funding up to £700,000 to close the gap from 2021 to 2024, as well as £220,000 to Flexibility Works in 22-23 to support employers to address pay gaps and offer flexible working. Julian Martin. Thank you, Minister, for that answer and proof that uh, progressive policies are making a difference. In the last Parliament in the Economy and Fair Work Committee's inquiry into the gender pay gap, we found that social care workers are disproportionately female and low pay in this sector contributed to our gender pay gap. I would like to ask the Minister how the proposals of the National Care Service seek to improve pay and conditions for this mainly female workforce and how an improved care offer might mean that less women need to leave work to meet unmet caring responsibilities. Minister. The Fair Work Agenda is at the heart of the Government's proposals for a national care service. And 
Also, from April 23, adult social care workers will see their pay increase to a minimum of £10.90 per hour. That represents a 14.7% increase for these workers in the last two years, and we will transfer £100 million to deliver that uplift, taking recur recurring funding for these workers to £600 million per year. The National Care Service will also pave the way for the introduction of full collective bargaining across the social care sector, which will further help to support improved pay and standardised terms and conditions. So I, I hope that reassures the member that fair work is indeed at the heart of our motivation for setting up a national care service.